With the events of last week now coming sort of fully into view, there has really, really been pretty much the unanimous view that that was the end of Boris Johnson. He tried to mount a rebellion and failed. He tried to marshal his troops and yet they wouldn't march up the hill. And yet this now fall of a, of a once guy who led the Conservative Party to a massive, overwhelming majority is now done completely within the Conservative Party. But more importantly, we should say, was this also signaled the end, or at least very much potentially the long, yet some would say probably withdrawn out end, because it's certainly not going to be the last we hear of the ERG, probably for some time to come. But this goes to show you that the ERG, the bane of Conservative Prime Ministers, of, of David Cameron and Theresa May, and you know, going all the way back to the days of John Major, the hated faction within the party. But now, as we've said, there are now factions within factions in the in the in the you know in the Conservative Party. There's the there's the Northern Research Group, there's the COVID Recovery Group, there's the bizarre woke response group. There's the growth coalition led by Liz Truss and several other, the, the free market fundamentalists. And then, of course, there are the unspoken groupings as well, which don't really officially have a name. There's also the big sort of traditional groups of the uh, One Nation Tories. They are still very much there, but all now have reached a dividing factor on this. This once but very powerful group has now all but disappearing into what could be a very, very long night. Maybe one where the sun will never once set again upon this once powerful group, or at least grouping of MPs. So uh, before we do uh, go to that, I'll, I'll move into sort of conservative home, because uh, it's again fun to get the conservative take uh, on this. Um, you know, please do remember to click on that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below there are links to my Patreon page, the one-off donation link, and the Buy Me Coffee link, and of course the Pony Club, and the YouTube Thank You button as well. So let's go over, let's go over and have a look at what what the Conservative Home are having to say about this because this this is fascinating because it, it's not just anyone sort of declaring the the long death, shall we say, although at least the long drawn out um, death of the ERG. This is Conservative Home, and as I always make the point, the Conservative Home is a very, very influential blog on the Conservative Party. I, I, I keep on trying to point out to you, that's why we go and keep our eyes constantly peeled to see what Conservative Home are saying, at least what they're doing and what they're, 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 the, the, the cases and arguments they're making, because it's in very, very influential. So when they're saying that the ERG is sort of done, that their time in the sun is, is, is well and truly over, and that they're now a group that is losing power, or as, as we'll <laughs> see in a moment, made by uh, Will, and it's very, very rare that I propose me and Will, of course, in the past will have agreed uh, on something when we've cut articles he's done in the past in Conservative Home, I agree with him. This is the this is the long drawn out um, roar of the European Conservative group. This is their last dying breath, I think. I, and as much as we will probably hear about them in the future, they're not going to go away instantly. But I think they will slowly and slowly and slowly diminish more and more and more. So let's go into. Uh, sort of conservative home and see what will the young conservative of the conservative home group thinks about all this. So this is titled the melancholic long uh, withdrawing role of the European research group. <coughs> so in 1986, ahead of the one of the most perpetual reboots uh, that dog uh, that dogged the superhero world. DC Comics published "Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow," penned by Alan Moore of the Watchmen fame. It imagined a world ten years after Superman's disappearance as a farewell tribute to the most famous illegal immigrant from Krypton. I, I like how 
you uh, you've mentioned that well. Um, if you are a, a DC fan, I wonder what you'd think of the fact that one of the most poignant, biggest, well-known superheroes has always had the fact that he is an illegal immigrant and and has had that illegal immigrant story told, and yet it's been told to be, of course, one of the most famous superheroes of all time. Just interesting that you would sort of like to mention that part, but hey, there you go. So, alas, I long ago gave up any aspirations of writing comic books to dabble in the more infallible world of politics instead. And so many of, uh, many of my memory of the plot isn't what it was, but the title, at least, has weighed on my mind since yesterday's vote on the Stormont break. Readers, whatever happened to the European Research Group? or the Spartans, as their self-styled mythology puts it, which has now become an interchangeable term for its most ardent members. Rishi Sunak has won his votes by 515 votes to 29, despite the suggestions that the night before the rebellion could reach the into the 30s or 40s, the actual number of Tory MPs who voted against the Windsor framework was only 22. That was despite Mans uh, Marc Francois, the ERG chair, strongly advocating, including on Conservative Home, that the Eurosceptic MPs should reject the deal. The rebellion included three ex-Tory ministers, Ian Duncan Smith, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, and a plethora of former cabinet ministers, such as Priti Patel, Simon Clark, and there was also Johnson loyalists, such as Johnson Gillies, serial, be serial rebels like Christopher Hope, and those ex-Spartans, the ex the GXL, who neither never voted for Theresa May's deal, now or never, even Sunak's own, such as Andrea Jenkins. The ERG has argued one should also include the 47 Conservative abstentions, because of whom, the group suggests, the Prime Minister would have had then to rely on opposition votes. But this math is a very little fishy. Not only does it rely on the uh, every opposition MP voting against it, but it also assumes that the, all the abstentions are the equivalent to a no vote. And this, I think, is what we'll be hearing for years. That in reality, uh, the ERG won uh, uh, on this battle. They, there should have been at least a more significant rebellion because, oh yeah, they, they really intended to vote no, but they couldn't bring themselves to, to vote no for one way or another. And of course, I, I've said before, in the days uh, leading up to this vote, or certainly on Monday and Tuesday, there was a big whipping operation not to get some of those no's into the yes column, but into the abstain column, because that way it would reject any notion of potential rebellion. And even then, bear in mind that if you, uh, as we were talking about, the, um, the 43 MP mark, if it reached that mark, which... They were all saying, yeah, we can potentially reach that mark. And there was no one saying that they couldn't because they'd shown in the past that they could marshal at least over 100 potential MPs uh, in their sort of past votes. So the threat the ERG making was, was very, very real. And of course, anything above 43 starts to eat into the conservative majority. At that point, they would have needed and required the Labour opposition votes to be able to pass it. That's not fishy math. That's the absolute truth. But there you go. <coughs> One could also speculate that sympathisers of the abstainers such as Nadine Doris, Nigel, Nigel Ad Adams, Colin Burns might lean towards the Johnson way of thinking. But Grant Shapps, uh, Mims Davis, both ministers, or even David Monell, Myra Miller, and those even notorious Euros, uh, those notorious Eurosceptics. The more one considers it, the more one thinks that Francois and co are trying to grasp at straws, and that, to mix a few metaphors, the Spartans have faced the Waterloo. And sort of, I agree, but I will still say 48 abstention, uh, 40, uh, you know, 47 uh, conservatives abstentions. That's a lot of abstentions. That is a lot of abstentions. And once again, whenever we talk about this, mostly, you know, conservatives, we notice Will hasn't mentioned it at all either. There was a big whipping operation to get people from the no's into the yeses. And that says a lot 
that says a lot that even Sunak wasn't confident enough to move those those no's into yeses, but no's into abstains. And is this, I, I think it does go to show you the, the split really that's happened in the ERG massively over, over this deal, massively. I mean, even Steve Baker said, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to accept the deal. When a couple of months ago, this deal was put a couple of, well, a couple of years ago now, this deal was put not only by the EU, but by the UK government. And time and time again, people like Steve Baker said no to it, that that's not a non-starter, that's not acceptable. But yet, there he was now, just a couple of days ago, saying, no, that's fantastic. And Boris Johnson voting against this deal would make him look like a pound shop Nigel Farage. I say... Interesting times indeed in the Conservative Party. So, how did it come to this? So, this is going to be Will's explanation as to why he thinks the ERG have been so split. And, and to, uh, to an extent, I do actually agree with him. I do actually agree with him on, on some of the points he's about to make. So, once the ERG was the group upon whom the lobby waited with bated breath for any white smoke and who, just a short month ago, Sunak even paged homage to, out of a fear that they would jump behind Penny Mordaunt. Yet, it now seems he need not have bothered. Their bite is not equal to their bark. The central fact is this. Brexit has been done. The group is a victim of its own success, by holding out, getting uh, changes to the withdrawal agreement, and then achieving their ultimate end goal. They are confronted by the problems of the, uh, of the peace. They could agree that they wanted to be out of the European Union and that May's route was not the one that they wanted. But what next? Which was always the question we were asking at the time. Brexiteers no longer have the fear that if they do not uh, hang together, Brexit will not happen. The ERG's discipline first fractured when several of its key members or even allies, such as Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg, broke ranks and voted for May's deal leaving the 28 or so so-called Spartans to resist it to the last. That did not pass, and then, of course, they relied heavily upon their other great ally, Jeremy Corbyn, and one notes that the 300 at Thermopylae were ultimately, of course, overwhelmed. Former chairs like Suella Braverman, Chris Heaton-Harris, and Steve Baker are now in government, robbing the ERG, of course, of, of always any debatable status, of their being arbiters of the Eurosceptic opinion. The division now, as was with the last vote on May's deal, is between those facing the practicalities of Brexit and those who want the perfect to be the enemy of the better. As I've mentioned before, thinking the thinking behind the Windsor framework is not that it is the last step in Brexit negotiations, it is a springboard from which the Northern Ireland Protocol can be chipped away. Once an, uh, one agreement at a time. And opponents of the Windsor framework insisted that the uh, insisted that in the gradualism that all they want and that they uh, all they want now, a la Freddie, they want it all and they want it all now, a la Freddie Mercury. Um, I'd be very much disagree. Look, the idea that you can sort of now start to chip away at the Northern Ireland Protocol just because you've got the Windsor framework done is very very shaky ground because. What are you going to do? What's the next step? How do you chip away at the next part of this? You know, what agreement do you go to next? Remember, Jacob Rees-Mogg's own bill, the uh, the retained EU law bill, is pretty much dead because any divergence that the UK makes can be now met in the form of the Windsor Framework with additional checks now being put in place. Checks that at the moment are not necessary, but all of a sudden become a necessity once you start this divergent path that the Conservatives and people like Jacob Rees-Mogg want to take. There are big problems, and of course there are still other problems in and around the Northern Pro the, online, uh, the, the Windsor framework, the how does the sort of the storm and break still work in sort of practicality? What happens, for example, 
um if like i don't know just say for it as you know as a, as a hypothetical the dup get a big majority become sort of first minister and are able to sort of uh veto a a potential eu sort of law or, or regulation what happens then there are there are still big questions of course to be to be asked about this and how it all still works out but overall this is a this is a fantastic piece of work and ultimately as a lot of <laughs> some even former erg people are saying angela angela jenkins for example even rishi sunak have been saying how amazing it is for northern ireland to be in the single market and of course as we even saw yesterday chris heaton harris was saying how most of the uk would you know bite their arm off to get a very similar deal well eventually i think that's going to be the same thing i can very very easily see um the rest of the uk going back into the single market and customs union very very easily um and i think it just goes to show you that the whole brexit argument has is now deflated they have been very much defeated on every single level now politically economically and even sort of the battle for ideas people think that brexit was was wrong and as we move on we are going to see more and more effects. They cannot escape it. GB News recently with, with Jacob Rees-Mogg's own encounter with an economist saying how bad Brexit was doing to the economy. Very quickly, Mogg had to go on the old fallbacks of, oh, we got the vaccine out already. Oh, that we are somehow, quote, better. And you could see the economist flinch quickly to, to sort of... Um, the sort of rebuttal, but Mog even himself tried to move the, the, the question on very, very quickly. Um, again, I think we will certainly be seeing more and more of that as time goes on. And like I say, as more time goes on, the less they can blame the pandemic, the less they can blame the war in Ukraine, because that's not going to go on forever. Same for inflation. Inflation will not be uh, sort of last forever. Eventually, you know, inflation will go down. They cannot continue uh, to blame those things, and eventually people will go, well, actually, that's Brexit. Even now, we are still having pretty much an open border for goods flowing into the UK because we cannot put the border checks in place because of the economic damage and chaos that that would inflict upon the UK. So scared was Jacob Rees-Mogg when he realised that very thing, the one he had always hoped for even he was having to delay those checks and i ultimately think those checks again are going to get moved again and i think they're just going to keep on moving it you know how long can you continue with this 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 nightmarish nonsense i think rishi sunak ultimately i think he's that's a question he may now have to sort of breach and, and start to really think about that but anyway, back to it. So, but this was always the problem, that the argument that the Spartans were key to delivering Brexit. Yes, they held out against May's uh, deal, preventing it from being implemented. But their agenda was entirely negative. Without the vote leave pros and the reopening of the withdrawal agreement and the 2019 election campaign, they really got Brexit done would have been impossible. The Eurosceptic's central question is no longer how do we get out, but what do we do now we are? And that is the question they cannot answer, because this has split the ERG. Because even as we saw with Rees Mogg's um you know retained EU law bill, this was splitting Brexiteers saying this bill is completely unnecessary. Why are we doing this? It doesn't make a lot of sense to to do such drastic um deregulation and, and and such in such a drastic way and it all goes back to that central point of regulations most of the eurosceptics most of those um hardcore are basically free market fundamentalist thinking that they think the government should not be involved in any form of market regulation whatsoever the market should regulate themselves but time and time again we have seen just how important regulations are you know, take the recent chemical uh, spills in, in with the train derailment in America. That was ultimately caused because of deregulation, not only around 
uh, chemicals, but also trains as well. And not only that, as I've said before, there is regularly chemical spills happening pretty much on a weekly basis in America because of the deregulation around that. Because I guarantee you, that's not why people voted to leave the EU, so that we could have all these low regulations, because all the Brexiteers and vote leave was like, oh no, we're going to keep this high level of regulation, it's going to be amazing. But now all the Brexiteers and the, and the vote leavers are now going, oh well, mm, now we want to sort of roll back regulation, we want to relax it, we want to diverge, which basically means lessen it, <laughs> because that's the sort of buzzword they're trying to use. We're not trying to lower regulations, we want to diverge. And very often when you've actually managed to sort of nail these people down, it is diverging. Rhys Mogg himself uh, has said it in a, in a podcast, again, with, with the with the author of this, this blog, Will, pretty much said it himself. He wants to lower chemical regulations among everything from workers' safety working in chemical plants to sort of the transportation of, of chemicals to the um, regulation and creation of them. But... None of the big chemical manufacturers in the UK, bar one, who is a avid, hardcore Brexiteer, actually wants to do it. Bit strange that, when the Conservatives constantly tell us, oh, businesses would love to, to, to deregulate and get rid of all this, you know, ridiculous EU law. But the insane thing is every time they talk about that and you get the business comment from it, they're not for it. They are not for it at all. But anyway, let's get back to it. So let's finish this off. So yesterday's vote exposed the two different answers to that. To remain crouched in habitual opposition or to work from where we find ourselves. So that so few followed the big names yesterday shows that one side uh, on which the most Brexit MPs are falling. Uh, once the sea of faith uh, we placed in the ERG was full, but now we only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar. And that is the state of the, the ERG. Even conservative homes are like, yeah, they're done. They are they are done. They are spent as a uh, as a political force. They'll still be there in the background. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. But the 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 power they once wielded, the the threats that they made to sort of previous prime ministers again, May Cameron, going all the way back to sort of John Major, they can no longer make. Unless they can actually now, once again, physically prove at the voting box that they can deliver those votes. And unless they can somehow reprove that in the near future, I, I very much doubt that we will be hearing once again about the power and the prestige of the ERG that they once command within the Tory party. And this, of course, will lead to potentially affect future... Uh, you know, conservative leadership elections. Hey, I'm a pro-European MP. I don't have to worry about the ERG anymore. <laughs> it's it really is not beyond the realms of, of possibility. As we said before, Brexit was is always always on a path to constant reversal. Like I say, we're seeing it now. We're seeing our economy suffer. We're seeing the British public saying, well, actually, Brexit was a wrong idea. We're seeing people who voted for Brexit saying, well, the, the, the things that were promised have not been delivered. Even Nigel Farage is trying to sort of restart the Brexit bandwagon because he can even see that his glorious revolution that he was sort of part of is failing, that the fire is, is slowly going out. It's nothing but embers. But even he is desperately trying to pour fuel on that fire by saying, no, you don't understand. Brexit hasn't been done yet. So, ultimately, this is, well, probably the end of the ERG. Ultimately, I think any history of the ERG will probably certainly continue for a few years, but this and the vote that happened on Wednesday of the Windsor Framework will be showing the point at which the ERG finally lost its teeth. So, as always, thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to click on that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page, the one after today's link called Buy Me Coffee, uh, and all the other uh, links again down below. And of course, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you all next time.